welcome to the show. Um, I am Angela Montoya. I am here, the author of Sinner's Isle, uh, coming to you by Joy Revolution, um, October 31st, 2023. <laughs> and I'm here with uh, Melanie Schubert, who's ready to go on a cowboy adventure. <laughs> I feel like she's ready to go. She's ready to go on a Jurassic quest with her dino earrings and her cowgirl shirt. <laughs> it's well, not. It's not. At first, when Melanie came on, I thought she was like in a business shirt. Like I thought she was like, <laughs> I thought she was like, you know, like business casual. She's got like a a button up shirt. It's got like, it's got like sleeves. Look at the back. Oh, 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 oh. I've got, we I've got have track pants on certs, not certs. <laughs> Can you see that? That shirt. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, sexy. That shirt is like the mullet. That is a mullet of shirts. If I've ever seen a shirt, it's like it's <laughs> it business in the front and party in the back because it had it, it was open in the back. She is wearing a mullet top. Um, wait, can I ask you something? Are mullets, do a lot of Aussie dudes like rock mullets? Okay. So <laughs> I'm very amused by your pronunciation of mullet. <laughs> it's oh, mullet. how do you say it? Mullet. Oh, mu- mullet. Um, second of all, mullets have long been a topic of uh, both joy and ridicule. <laughs> It is both an iconic Australian thing and right now it has made a revival to the point where every morning there's a there's a boys school near me and every morning when I go get coffee like if it's the time that they're going to school I'll see a bunch of the boys and my notification that the mullet has been reborn is seeing hundreds and hundreds of male high schoolers sporting said mullet Damn. Yeah, and it's not just like a surfer boy thing anymore. Like ev- every boy in school who wants one has one. It's like that they all have one. And I'm just, I'm so amused by it, disturbed, amused, delighted. Yes. I don't know what else to say. It's like the most horrific haircut, but it's also iconic. <laughs> it is a cultural event. Do you yes. not have it there? Is that is it not a haircut there? So... So I think obviously like rednecky, like, you know, Southern people will have mullets, right? Yeah. Joe Dirt. Have you ever seen the movie Joe Dirt? I yes. I haven't seen uh, it, but I know the image. Yes. <laughs> so I, you know, that is like the image, I think, when you think of mullets. Um, but I think kids will, will rock a mullet ironically. That's the, yes, same. Yes. Yeah. It's so, very okay. much, it's either the bo- most boganous bogan rocking it, or it's like kids rock, or like trendy people rocking it ironically, yeah. Yes, like Crocs. Yeah, and like I'm so like hot and trendy, I can wear the shittest thing and still pull it off. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Melanie, time to rock the, the mullet. I think that's your next. Well, to be <laughs> honest... To be honest, oh. I have I'm due for a haircut, but if I pull out, if I unslick my hair from the back, you'll see I I kind of am sporting a mullet at the moment. It's quite perverse. <laughs> see, you are a girl <laughs> of the times. You know what I mean? <sighs> I love it. It's it's interesting. I watched like a little clip cuz um like in the Hispanic community, there's like a haircut called like the Edgar haircut where it's like this like a bowl cut kind of a thing and and people <laughs> yeah and people like tease these kids oh edgar there's like edgar's everywhere in california um but i i saw this video about it and it's it's actually like ingrained in hispanic culture and it and, and it like predates uh like colonialism and um and the indigenous peoples of you know like north america and that they would have haircuts traditionally kind of like an edgar haircut Really? But because of colonialism and, um, you know, all that stuff, the haircut was kind of stripped away, but we are reclaiming it. And so <laughs> I just thought it was so interesting. So I'm now I'm wondering if the mullet has some sort of like cultural <laughs> significance. Oh my gosh. I will I Google. 
Yes, I'll yes we need to research. <laughs> I'll Google and get back to you. <laughs> I feel like it's probably not culture. I mean, at this point, it is culturally significant, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know if it has historical significance, but I will um I will research and I will update you next next show. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I love it, but I'm convinced to be honest. I'm convinced with a bunch of stuff, but style is one of the things in particular that something that can be shunned and disliked. It it all depends who's rocking it and the confidence they're rocking it with. There have been atrocious things that I've absolutely thought was like the worst fashion. And then you see someone and you're like, yep, they just made that look very cool because they don't care. It's those people, yes. those fashionistas, and they're like, fuck you, I'm wearing Crocs with my Vulgari or whatever. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. Yes. My youngest, or not youngest, one of my younger sisters, they're all younger, <laughs> um, but she and her fiancé, Literally, he's like a ex kind of like rock star guy. And, you know, they just every time they come in the house, I'm like <laughs> waiting to see what these yes. two wear. And they it just only will ever work with these two. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I know he comes in, he's like six foot tall, long hair in a bun. And he's rocking like a poncho with overalls and like leather, like slip on shoes. And I'm like. Yeah, and like all this jewelry. I'm like, bro, but oh, it works for him. No, I know. My friend Cyrus in New Zealand is like that. Like what it the th the abominations he manages to pull off and it looks like fashion. And suddenly I'm like, oh. And and speaking of that, he currently has a mullet. And I was like, of course oh! you have a fucking mullet because it's back in fashion and you're gonna make it work. I don't of think course. I'm of course. I'm still not sold, but like but yeah, I know that vibe, those vibe of people. And you're like, they did it. They went there and it's working somehow. It's the confidence. It's the confidence. They yeah. feel good. And I, yes, that's why I have this shirt on. This shirt yes. makes me feel confident. It is uh, uh, Melanie and I, our faces on a shirt. Um, and so, and Melanie's mullet shirt makes her feel good too. I have, to, I have to say, I live in those shirts, like mo a lot of too. The They're so comfortable. And the reason yes. I don't have it today is because it was dirty. I was like, damn it, my shirt. We would have been matching. I'm never I wearing just washed it. it. Oh, you just washed <laughs> it. I hand yeah. wash mine because I wear them so often. <laughs> That's probably a good idea, honestly, because the blue one is starting to, she's starting to like, the, our faces are starting to, to peel to off. Fade. Well, you know why? <laughs> You know no. what? You know what I, I realized know. after our episode with Jackie. So when I load that episode this week, that will be our seventieth episode of the podcast. Holy I shit! Holy shit! That's why our face is appealing because we've been around. <laughs> <laughs> We're old bitches now. We are old <laughs> bitches. We are crusty. <laughs> we are crusty. <laughs> We've seen it all. I was honestly like, I feel a bit teary now randomly, but I'm just like, wow. Could you, like 70. That is so wild. Wild. Wow. How? I don't know. Like, I know, it, I knew it was a lot. Like, I know we've done a lot, but to actually put a number to it and be like, we're, we're closer to a hundred than not. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, that, yes, feels, that is feels good. We'll have to celebrate wow. for our hundredth somehow. Our hundredth episode. Yeah. I don't know how. But... I don't know. I'll have to fly to Australia. <laughs> oh, that would be glorious. Imagine we did an episode. I don't know if we could take each other seriously, though. In person, we'd just be cackling our heads off. <laughs> it, yeah, it would not even, I don't even, it would be like 20 seconds. And that's all the good stuff we would have. It would just be howling the rest of the time. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. one day, one day it will happen. When you're touring Australia, your, mm. your Australia Sinners Isle tour. Yes. Then we will have a how, how would How would you say, like, Sinners Isle in the most, like, bogan Australian accent? Oh, you mean Sinners Isle? <laughs> <laughs> oh, give me that Sinners Isle. Isle. You'd say the I with an A really hard. Isle. Oh, Isle. <laughs> 
oil like that oil oh yeah give me that sin oh like you oil. say oil sin is oil I mean I'm really going there with like the Kath and Kim accent but that's that's how I envision it being that's my artistic <laughs> creation of it I would I would love to go to Australia and just hear one person like introduce my book that way like <laughs> if I were to go like, like say there was a tour okay in this imaginary world and I'm in the heart of Australia. Yeah. And this lady comes out looking like Kath or Kim from Kath and Kim. Yeah. And she is, she says, well, I've got, okay, go ahead and say it. Sin is oil. I've got sin is oil here. <laughs> I should do a clip for you. I should do a reel, a promo reel. <laughs> Just uh, right old Sheila, this one. She's she's true blue, the one and only Angela Montoya, author of Sinner's Oil. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, please. Can you, Melanie, find a way, find a way for this to happen, just so for this moment. <laughs> I should interview people on the street, but the problem is I live in Melbourne, so there's not as many strong. When I... When I was doing my teaching degree, I went out to Cambalda West District, out in the mining towns, the like Northern Territory, the like red desert, blue plants. It was like an alien terrain, literally like population 50. But my cousin was out there working the mines with her husband. Well, her husband was working the mines and she was teaching. So I hooked it up that I did one of my pracs out in the desert. And the accents you get out there are just something else, just like... Real class. I love it. <laughs> oh, I love it. I, I am here for this. <laughs> That's beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful accent. Beautiful. It is beautiful. It yes. is beautiful. It's iconic. It is. It is. <laughs> I, 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 yes. <laughs> I love it. Well, how's this week been treating you? I, I, I was going to be sure this time to not be as chatty. I was meant to take a vow of silence today because yesterday I chat the house down. <laughs> uh, yes. No, I, like I said, I am here for all of your chats. I love them so dearly. Um, so since I've spoken to you, it's been a while. <laughs> since last we chatted. <laughs> which it was yesterday. I know. Um, I worked on, I worked on Sinus Oil today. Or no, I didn't. I'm sorry. I just had to say that. I didn't even say it right. I apologize. You did. I didn't I like... Okay. Um, no, I worked a little bit on my uh, new project, just like a little, like for an hour, just kind of farted out some words. <laughs> <laughs> And the catchphrase of the day, dear listener. I just farted out some words. <laughs> I just made you Australian, but <laughs> yeah. it sounds so much cooler when you say it. it. Sounds so much more funny. Um, yeah, I just just um. So we'll see. I'm just gonna. I think after we're done here, I might do some grocery shopping and then write a little bit more. Just <laughs> taking away, taking away. You know, farting them out here and there, little poots. Little, little um, nuggets, little, little nuggets of joy. Yeah, just, no, no, not nuggets. No, we're not nu no nuggets. No nuggets have come out. Okay, but nuggets is not good. <laughs> no, I said poot with a T, little poots. Okay, not poop, poot. What's little poots? Like little, little cute farts, little poots. <laughs> <laughs> no? No poots for you? Uh, I mean, oh yeah, like let's go with poots. I'm here for when I hear poot, I just hear think of um Putanesca. <laughs> Is that a cheese? I thought it was like an American thing, isn't it? Fr like loaded fry. Oh, it's Canadian. Loaded fry uh, cheese and shit, like a pudin. <laughs> or is it pasta? <laughs> it might be Italian pasta sauce, Putanesca. <laughs> it's a little different. It's a little different. Yeah, well, that's uh, but yeah. good. Go have your little Thanks. poot after this. <laughs> Thanks. I <laughs> shall. I shall. <laughs> I hope we look it up and it's not something like extremely vulgar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, little poots. <laughs> are you reading anything uh, at the moment? What do you? Ooh, okay. Yes. I, what did I? Oh, I just finished Caught in a Bad Fomance, which is um, 
Yes. yes. L. Gonzalez Rose, who is a Joy Revolution uh, uh, writer. And so uh, her book doesn't come out in December, but I got it uh, E-Arc. And I just finished that. And it's so, so, it's so cute Aww. and funny. And it's like, almost like Romeo and Juliet, um, but gay, of course. And then, yes. um, and it kind of gives like, summer campy vibes but during christmas so it's just like the perfect book honestly like it just gives you everything you need and then i'm listening to the fourth wing which is oh. like a viral book it's all over book talk really? on tiktok oh yeah so influenced. i'm influenced <laughs> i have i have been influenced it's like a i think it's new adult okay like a fantasy romance and with dragons um, so Maybe. I'm a few chapters in, yes. And it's, I on it, I like it so far. I think it's gonna, it, it's a viral sensation. So yeah, I was influenced and it's good. What are you up to? What are you reading, Melanie? How's um, your day? What have you been doing? I am finished in reading. I'm finishing up um, Pardo's book, Last Sunrise oh. in Eterna. Damn, it's good. Like it oh, is, good. it was everything I wanted to read. Like her voice is very, um, I just easily picture her voice. I gobble it up. And then the other thing I've just started, just started this week, is our dear friend Katia de Becerra's book. I got, was lucky enough to get an arc of When Ghosts Call Us Home, so it's not even out yet. And, yeah, like, it. I'm afraid it's definitely, like, on the spookier side. The intro is definitely, like, her spook audience is going to be so excited by it because she's really gone for, I had to hide from a few pages, but it's it's glorious. I'm so, so happy for her. I think it's going to be, it's going to be a big one. I, that is so cool. Honestly, I'm really, really, because I, I love Katya. And it's so funny because she's the nicest human. Like having her on, I was just like, this is like, this is literally sunshine in a human form. And yeah. to know that she writes like these dark, <laughs> spooky books, I live for that. That's the yeah. best. This one's <laughs> definitely on the spook. I think in the past, oh, well, I'll see where she goes with it. No spoilers, no spoilers. But in the past, it's been more, uh, you know, like, you know, like how the mummy has like, a spooky the movie the mummy and it's got like the spooky fairy that comes back to life and all of that this one yes. feels m like a bit more on the paranormal end but yeah I'm excited to see where it goes if I can brave the pages which is a good sign because I have a very low radar it's a good sign for her actual like target audience that I'm like terrified <laughs> <laughs> but no so yeah um Slowly, I mean, I'm slow. I'm really slow reading at the moment, but slowly getting through things. I mean, they're great books. So when I when I am getting to them, and of course, I've been finishing Ice Planet Barbarians book two at night. <laughs> oh, how is that? How is it? <laughs> it's okay. Like it. It's oh, it's good. It's good. It's just I found that towards the end, I was like, oh yeah, I think one book was enough. For me, you know, like, the yes. novelty has worn off and now I'm like, I think I'm probably not a super fan of alien porn enough <laughs> to like <laughs> commit to the whole series. But, but yeah, but which makes it a perfect uh, falling asleep book because I'm not like super committed. <laughs> You know? Put you right to sleep. Put you right to bed. <laughs> and I forgot to ask you. I, I'm so ex I keep forgetting, but I am so excited that you've been catching up on old episodes of RuPaul. Is that what you're oh, watching now? Yes, yes. We are so like on Hulu, which is what I've been watching on, like the streaming service, they don't have all of the old episodes. Ah. However, I so we we my daughter and I have been watching um like the earlier uh all stars RuPaul's yeah. all stars and so those have been fun so we got we watched a few um up to the point where we don't know some of the queens because we haven't gotten to those old uh, uh seasons yeah. so I um have have a new another streaming service so and that has all of them so we shall watch them all why are you cackling, and, and yeah. why are you cackling I, that you have it <laughs> 
I, because I got in trouble because you are, we are, we already pay for one streaming service, but I got another one so I could watch RuPaul's Drag Race. No, I mean, it's that's important. Where, it is important. Uh, my Moira just came out. It you is did, important. You said it. it is, but like, I'll be honest with you. That's how we've got sucked into having, I think now we've got Stan, Disney, Netflix. And to be honest, I was ready to sign up for Hulu yesterday because I really wanted to watch that new cult documentary about Hillsong. Have you seen that? I I meant to talk to you about that. Okay. Yes. Oh, I yes, I have. Because I can't get Hulu. I'm dying. <laughs> you gotta get Hulu. You gotta I can't because I'm Australian. I've been uh, I've been cock blocked out of Hulu because of my country. Ah. <laughs> uh. Damn you, Australia. I know. Yeah, yeah. because I, and um, we both know we are both part of the church. And I, for me, I was part of um, the Assembly of God church, which mm. like Hillsong was like their like dream. Like they were the cool it church. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I know. In, in the Pentecostal church. Oh. And, um, and so I knew so much about Hillsong from the church I was part of. Yeah. And so it's just so interesting. Oh, you've seen yeah. it already, the doco? I have. <gasps> Indeed, I'm so I have. jealous right now. <laughs> yes. Dude, I've been watching all of those. Like um Shiny Happy People, which I, I think I talked about. That one's know. on my list. I think yes. maybe that's what when I went looking for that one when you said I suddenly found yes. all these Hillsong docos. I'll start watching that one today. I forgot about it because I got so yes. fixated with the Hillsong one. Because I also like we, I grew up Adventist, but like we definitely had Hillsong was what we were singing half the time oh, yeah. in the youth church. The old yes. people, it was a bit, it was a bit satanic for the old people. A bit risque. A bit, <laughs> a bit risque. risque. Those yes. drums, those drums were a bit frightening. Yeah. <laughs> bless them, bless them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> bless their hearts. No, it's so all of the. It's so fascinating to lift the veil and take a peek behind the scenes of what was really going on. Um, so yes, please, everybody get Hulu if you can. <laughs> oh, the burn. <laughs> well, I can access all of RuPaul's on stand. Oh, well, I can now because I got another one. <laughs> 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 I've got a problem. I'm stepping my pussy up. Yes. That's just like Mama Ru said. I had to step my pussy up so I, I can watch more RuPaul. <laughs> you you did, but I just I love this journey for you. And and like I said before, it's one of my favorite catchphrases to just like snap myself out of a funk. If I'm ever feeling, you know, I'll give myself a window if I'm having a bad moment to feel sorry for myself. And then I'll kind of like trick myself into like, I'll be like stuff like that. Like you just step your pussy up, bitch. Step it up. Step your pussy up, bitch. Now have, yes. yeah. I have to ask, like, how have you found, um, cause I felt like the combination of uh, like humor, depth, you know, like b before you watched it, I was like, I feel like you're just going to really resonate with so much of it. Have you found it to be like that? Yes, that's what I honestly really just, I love it. All, mm -hmm. all aspects of the show, you know, it's like really campy. It's fun. You're watching them put together garments and, and then, you know, so all of these like fun things are happening, but then also these like deep conversations are happening with the Queens and, mm -hmm. um and, you know, you're just getting to know these people and their stories and understand you know, why maybe they are a little put offish because this happened yeah. in their life, you know, and this is why I wear this sort of drag because when I was a boy, you know, I think it was Trixie was mm -hmm. saying, you know, something, I think, uh, that's why he named himself that in particular because of something somebody had teased him about, you know, growing up. So I just thought, and it's like taking your power back. So I was just like all of it, perfect show, 10 out of 10, highly recommend. I agree. Uh, and I think like um, it's it's such an important show as well, you know, like I, I'm i sure we've chatted about this before, but like growing up so conservative, like one of the one of the reasons why like I and I mean, it's Pride Month, so we should it's a perfect time 
to be like chatting about RuPaul's because it just really does, it does so much for the community. I think that show, and I and that's why yeah. I've always I think Mama Ru is one of my spiritual guides in this life because yeah, like you can grow up with a complete different understanding of things, and until you see the people behind the stories, you can be in this like one like dogma mindset and like I literally grew up thinking that stuff was evil you know and as a child you have no ability to differentiate between that when that's what's being taught to you until you become an adult and that's why I'm like passionate about those shows and like and whatever but like yeah it's it's such a perfect blend of all of that it doesn't take itself too seriously yes which I think is important as well and above all, it's just the biggest queer hug that everyone everyone should be watching that show <laughs> to understand themselves, to understand life better. <laughs> to just no, it's true. Yeah. It's and it's like in many ways, it's like a celebration too of like even f- like masculinity, femininity, like just like being who you are and being yeah. comfortable, kind of being both or one more than the other and just like celebrating who you are yes. it's, it's it's beautiful yes I love that so much and and I see our time is ticking away because we could rant about this for hours no doubt and I've got five percent left on my battery I just realized so before my computer dies I usually have it fully charged that was a grave error we better read the bio of another amazing energy glorious wise human and we were so lucky to have I was going to say your artist because in my mind she is your artist because she did that beautiful artwork for you for Sinner's Isle Riley Riley Quinn do you want me to do it today sure or do you want to do it because you're proud mama moment I'm a proud mama sure I'll read the bio yeah Riley is proud to be both an artist and an author. She's passionate about visual storytelling, a love that has called her from an early age to the art of animation. Her interest is primarily in concept development with a focus on character design and storyboarding. Though she also enjoys hand-drawn animation projects and animates often in her free time. She's open to internship and job opportunities via email. Yes. Um, which... Which you y'all get in those emails because Riley Quinn Riley Quinn is honestly so talented, a gift yeah. to the world, and what she has to say in this interview literally had Melanie and I gagging. Yeah, just just dropped on the floor. Just thank you. We were gagged with all the amazing, just nuggets and wisdom that Riley had to share. So I can't wait for everybody to hear what she had to say. Yeah. She's very generous with her. It's something like we strive to have in this show to kind of be open about the process, the ups, the downs, and to not hoard information because I think historically it it has been like she said, a gated community and information has been withheld, but yeah, she's so generous with her information. You're going to learn some amazing tips that I will be implementing. I'm sure you will too. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So listeners, you're going to learn today the glorious ways in which, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know where I was going with that. (laughs) I don't know. I think the glorious ways in which Riley Quinn works and markets and lives. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) Let's bring the Riley on. I don't know why I do theme music. Well, it goes perfect because you have dinosaur ear- earrings on. So. Yes. Hello. Hi. Hi, Riley. Can y'all hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear awesome. us okay? Yes, I can hear you great. Oh, great. This I'm just excited seeing your face. <laughs> yeah, same to you. I mean, I see your reels all the time. But it's nice to talk with you in person. Yes. Sort of. <laughs> yes. I know. I It's funny because I'm just like keep staring at you because on your, um, you know, like your avatar, like profile pic or whatever it's. The oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Is uh, like a character, you know, of yourself. Right? And so <laughs> it's nice to see a human 
and right. you have so yeah. much there light is a person. Heart. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I try. It's the big ears, I think, um, that really make it look like me, but. I love it. Beautiful. Honestly, I'm obsessed. Oh, wait. Well, so you I haven't, love that huh? wait, so you haven't seen her face. This is the no, first I, I've time. seen Riley's face. I've okay. seen, <laughs> I've seen the face. I know the human, but she looks, <laughs> she looks better live is what I'm going Thank you. Doing. Thank you. I like to think so. <laughs> yes, I feel it. I see it. Well, welcome yeah. to the show. Thank We're you so, so thank you so much for having me. Yes. Oh, we had to have you. When oh. I saw that artwork you did for Angela, I was just like, we need her on the show at once because we want to talk about all parts of the publishing industry. And this is, I think, fan art and art in general is a very important part. <laughs> so important oh my gosh it's I think sometimes the lifeblood of a fan base just the art that people make inspired by stories I mean obviously I'm very biased towards art but um I think it just speaks volumes how much a story is loved when you see a lot of art for it oh I got chills honestly just thinking about it because it's so true like when yeah. you like as soon as you're done reading a book and it's so good what do you do like you go to Pinterest and look for the art people have done like the fan art <laughs> you know what I mean? that's what I always do I'm like okay where is it give it to me and a lot yeah. of it's like like super fan ficky where they're like making the characters even that might not necessarily be together in the book but they are together in this artwork and I'm of like of course always Top romance tier. is key <laughs> yes. it's the best we all need but those romance. Yes, we all need those Zutara arcs and whatever <laughs> else the fan base may be. Oh, you knew, you knew straight away. That joke yeah. is over Angela Montoya's head because she won't watch Avatar yet and I still have a chip on my shoulder. <laughs> I watched it in 2020 when it went to Netflix. So I didn't have the nostalgia goggles. I just got to watch it. Yeah. Um, there, there was chemistry between characters that didn't end up together. That's all I'll say. Yeah, I I, I totally agree. <laughs> I don't want to start any fights. <laughs> I have my opinions. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's a true. fun watch, though. It's it's very um, you know, cozy and fun, and it still deals with some great themes. So if you ever want to fill your time and get inspired purely just on like a world building pedestal, it's incredible. It's really great. Mm. I agree. Yes. I see. Yeah, you are speaking right to Melanie's heart. I saw her eyes just <laughs> glow and glisten. <laughs> I love how I don't even have to say it anymore. You can read my eyes glistening through. Yeah. You're going to have to write a poem about me. Her eyes glistened. Yeah, now that through. sounds like a novel. <laughs> eyes <Absolutely>. glistening with excitement. <laughs> That's it right there. Okay, well, let's get into to you. Can you tell okay. us just a little bit about yourself? Yes, of course. So um, for people who don't know me, I am Riley S. Quinn, and I created the Pendant of Hyacinth trilogy, which is still ongoing, as well as a lot, a lot, a lot of art for a lot, a lot, a lot of other things. Though I also think that what a lot of people know me for is being both the artist and author of my own series. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people point out that it's interesting that I do all of my own promotion and all of my own art for books that I also write. So that's kind of become like my gimmick online. And there are a ton of other artists and authors who do this. And I think it's a really amazing combination of skills. But um, I've always had a passion for both. I grew up on a lot of animated media, which is art and story married together. And I think you see that influence a lot in the work that I've created. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, Melanie and I are just both <laughs> nodding because it's it's true. I mean, it's so amazing what you do. And obviously, so many people think so, too, because I know you have a good size following, at least on Instagram. And I'm sure I know you do YouTube as well, right? I'm just starting out there. Okay. and I'm hoping that'll go well. But Instagram and YouTube is pretty much it. Oh, I mean, like, pitch it now. Pitch, tell our listeners where they can find you on YouTube. Oh. Yeah, of course. So um, I try to be really consistent about my branding. Anywhere that I am, I will be labeled as Riley Quinn Art, but I am officially present on Instagram, 
and YouTube. I have a portfolio site, which is just rileycoinart.com. That's linked in the bio of my Instagram. And I am also on LinkedIn, but I don't know how many people especially care about that. When I did start, though, I found a lot of people were searching my name because I suddenly got a ton of connection requests. And I'm like, OK, I mean, if you if you want to chat on LinkedIn, you want to chat on LinkedIn. But that's pretty much the extent of my online presence. I try to keep it really focused because I found that when I can direct all of my energy to one or two platforms, I'm much more successful than when I try to have many. Ooh, I think I that's very practical life advice, right? It there. is. <laughs> you get to live outside of the internet, which is delightful. Yes. It must be nice. I need <laughs> to learn. I need to learn how to do this. Teach me your ways. <laughs> I shall. <laughs> Just watch Avatar and then it'll be a trade. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> no, it's so true. And I think like, oh man, I can't even remember now. Like some time ago, I just... Facebook, I just like kind of just cut off. I still have an account somewhere, but I was just like, you know what? Between all of these accounts, and I didn't, I still haven't dared to make a TikTok, which is probably to my own. Oh no, I don't either. <laughs> but it's just too much for my brain. Like it's like so there's no end to it. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna focus on Instagram and the occasional Twitter. And it's enough. <laughs> like even just that, I feel like I'm constantly on. So I think it's good advice to like focus. I mean, some people are social media pros, <laughs> Angela Montoya. <laughs> oh, yes. And yes. that's <laughs> like they're good at juggling multiples. But like I think it's worth like noting what you're capable of and and doing that, you know, or like what what gives you joy. Because if it starts to suck away, that's what I realize. If it starts to suck away from my creativity, you know, my first job isn't social media promo, if that makes sense. Right, of course. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Now, were you always this creative, even as a little baby, Riley? Um, I would like to think that I was. Uh, I've actually been drawing basically since I was two years old. Um, when my sister was born, I was, you know, I needed to be near her. And like my parents needed to watch both of us at the same time. So I would very often be in the high chair with blank paper and crayons. Mm. And uh, I never had coloring books. I just had blank paper. Um, because my mom was worried it would stifle my creativity if I was forced to color within the lines, which I guess worked out. So she was at least partially right. Um, but I have been drawing nonstop since then. And it just very naturally came to me to develop worlds and characters that I would place in those drawings. Mm -hmm. Around five or six, I was making those little books that I think a lot of kids make and then they make their parents staple it for them and then they read them. And they're like, this is amazing. I'm gonna be an author. I'm gonna be an illustrator. There were like five kids at my school that insisted that was the career we would have. Um, but I meant it, I was serious and I just never stopped. <laughs> That's Aww. the cutest. I love that from such an early age. You were like, yes, I'm running with it. No one can tell yeah. me. Yeah, I can no commit one... to a bit like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> yeah. I well, love you that. Need well, it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, and here it. you are, honestly. I mean, right? all these years later, you've got two books out. And uh, it's so it's a trilogy. Yes. Right? The third one's coming out in November. Oh, my gosh. So you made it happen. Baby Riley knew. And now a, adult Riley has is come through. Um, can you tell us about your your books? Give yes, us a I little can. summary if you can. I don't want any spoilers. But... No spoilers. No spoilers, or people wouldn't buy them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so as you know, two of the three are out. So the story is not yet complete, but just a general overview of kind of what goes on in the general genre. It is a young adult fantasy. Um, I found it to be most popular with the 13 to 16 demographic, though I do have readers outside of that age group. That really seems to be the group that especially resonates with the story, which is interesting to me because I actually started developing this world when I was 14. And I think that it really shows that it's what a 14 year old wants to read. Um, <laughs> but it's this fantasy adventure and it centers around these three people who come from completely different walks of life within this fantasy world in a time when the magical creatures that they all have these really special bonds with start to vanish and are instead replaced by these monsters that are wreaking havoc and you know destroying villages and then nobody knows what's going on and they can't find their friends the dreams and so now they have these new race of monsters called nightmares running rampant and so you have these three characters in completely different life situations 
completely different states of how okay they are with themselves that through some circumstance or another decide that it is their job to figure out what's going on and fix the world. And so those sudden paths bring them back together. And there's a lot of comedy and there's a lot of whimsy and adventure as much as there is like the crazy magical chaos. But ultimately the story is about the friendships that they form with each other, how our circumstances change who we are and how our connections with other people can change who we are for the better. Wow. It sounds amazing. <laughs> it's it's very sugary, sweet, fun, self-indulgent, cartoony fantasy. And I think when you read it, you can see what my influences are very easily and how they come from, you know, Disney and DreamWorks rather than from most book series. But I think that that's part of the fun of the series is that you can read it and know that everyone's going to get their happy ending and know that it's going to be a great story start to finish. They're going to be okay. They're going to learn something. And you don't have to like have that distress of like, what's going to happen? You could kind of just be like, oh, wow, magic. And I think that's fun. And people need that in this day and age. Yeah. They sure as hell do. No, and I, <laughs> they sure as hell do. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I was looking up maybe on Amazon, your books. And I, and I saw some, uh, one of the reviews was the sweetest thing. And it was, uh, I believe it was a mom saying that she reads this to her teen or maybe younger, like tween, um, like before bed every night. And I was like, this is the, this is the best review I think one could get is that, you know, it's like living proof. Like we are reading this and my child is enjoying it and we are loving it together. And I'm just like, yes, Riley's thing. <laughs> It's It's been very heartwarming to see something I never expected, how it's actually bringing family members together. Um, my expectation was that, you know, the teenager of the house would read it and then maybe talk about it with their friends online. But I actually get a lot of messages from parents that say they're sharing these stories with their children. And I'm a big family person. So that makes me all soft inside. And I'm like, really? And he's like, it's like, it's fun. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we're having fun. Are you okay? <laughs> But it's just so heartwarming because you never imagine your story is going to like actually impact people. You just know you care about it so much. And then to hear that people resonate or connect or form connections through reading it is so humbling and so inspiring at the same time. Yes. I love that so much. And it's so true. You just never know who's, but I think that's it. When you're writing from your heart, it's going to reach the other hearts that are like yours. It's just exactly. Like, yeah. So you talked about some of your inspirations. Yes. So what what would you say are some of your faves? Since you mentioned Disney and like, give us your favorite Disney. <laughs> oh, good question. On that is spot. so hard. I just laid it down, laid down. Yes. <laughs> You're killing me. Um, okay. So as an animation nerd and animation is what I'm studying. I'm actually still in college. I'm a full-time student on top of this. But um, I'm an animation major, so I have a lot of like really specific nerdy opinions. I'm just going to gloss over those for now because I know I have time constraints. <laughs> but I really like the late Disney Renaissance. So like mm -hmm. going into the 90s, sort of the 2000s, right before they really switched to 3D animation, when they were just getting really crazy and experimental, like um, Journey to Atlantis and Treasure Planet. I am obsessed with those movies because I feel like that's when Disney was really trying to do something different. They weren't so much relying on their classic formula. And while their formula is great, I just love seeing experimentation. And yeah. so that era of Disney, I'm very partial to. And, you know, of course, I mean, look at me. I grew up on The Little Mermaid. I watched it like five times a day. Um, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty. I'm very, very partial to the aesthetics of Sleeping Beauty. Even though the story itself does not shock me or wow me in any way, and it's kind of dated, something about Mary Blair's art, which is like what they base that entire world on, just gets me right in the heart. And I think that's why I love like fantasy and forests and magic and fairies is because of that movie. And then um, with DreamWorks, I'm more inspired by their recent work. And, you know, the new Puss in Boots movie, really great. I loved the stylistic choices. I loved the pacing and how they handled like the different archetypes of villain and then the how to train your dragon trilogy changed my brain altered my brain chemistry i will never be the same and that score is incredible you have taste yes i agree <laughs> you have taste right i'm you better know, I, right i mean <laughs> and i want to pick this apart a little because i'm fascinated what do you think it was about uh how to change your how to uh, how to train your dragon rather that changed your brain 
when you say you, it oh changed how your brain worked, what was it about it that just did it for you? I think, oh my gosh, where do I even start? <laughs> I have to like really, really think about this because I, I went through a phase where how to train your dragon, like after the third one came out, where it was all I talked about. Um, I personally am a sucker for the trilogy format. And I think that how to train your dragon is one of the perfect examples of how to cut a story into three like distinct pieces and have it all feel really cohesive and feel genuinely like fulfilled by the journey of the characters by the end. I also think it's one of the like few examples of a successful time skip in animation. I think a lot of animation does time skip as an afterthought, as a spinoff, and then it kind of feels a little bit corporate, like a sellout move to make more money off of a well-loved franchise. And we all know that the big companies have a problem with that. Yeah. But um, <laughs> it's just like the time skips, but you're excited and you're like, oh, wow, I can't wait to see how this character has changed. And the character continues to develop and grow. It's a great example of a successfully done extended cast. There are so many characters in those movies that if somebody said, this character is my favorite, I would know that there's plenty of reason within the canon for them to think that. It's not just because they read like a really good fan fiction about a side character. They still might have though. There's some great fan fictions for that fan base. <laughs> but just like the world building and, you know, the pull from like real culture versus fantasy culture and, you know, just the character dynamics feel very natural. And like the romance between Astrid and Hiccup is very real and human, where some Disney romances, even though I do love the corny self-indulgent love at first sight trope, like there's just a, a level of like, yeah, these could be real people who would fall for each other that I adore. I love this it. This makes me, I know, this makes me <laughs> happy. This conversation <laughs> just really makes me happy because I am such a Disney and like, uh, mm. you know, all of the, like, I can't get enough. So it makes me want to sit on my couch and rewatch all the shows. I don't think I've right. seen, I don't think I've seen the third, How to Train Your Dragon. So now I apologize. I apologize. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I this is my bad. avatar. I'm like, what? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have just slapped you in the face. No, well, if now I'm going watch to watch the third one. Watch them all in a row. Do like a movie marathon night. It'll be so fun. I will. I yeah. absolutely will because it is summertime. The kids are home. We're doing it. It's happening. Mm. Uh, now, I want to ask because, I mean, you obviously are like a pro about like breaking down story. How did you come about writing your own stories? Are you a plotter, a pantser? Did your art influence the writing first? What's the process for you? This is actually something really interesting that I was excited to talk about. Um, I definitely started as a pantser. I created this original version of the story, like I said, when I was 14. And at that point, I was basically taking every single trope that I loved, every cliche, and I was like, let's put them in a blender and just see what comes out. And it was so shameless. It was so corny, but that's why it was fun. And then I was like, now I'm going to draw these characters that look really cool. And then they're going to go on adventures. And the girl with the green hair and the guy who wears purple are going to kiss and be in love. And it's going to be great. <laughs> and that's kind of just all I really did because I was just a teenager starting to experiment with storytelling. Um, and then I got to about 16, 17, and I thought, maybe I actually have something here. And so instead of editing what I had already written, I just deleted everything so I couldn't even look at it. And I started over from scratch with no outline, just kind of my memory of what I had done before. Because I thought if I just went from memory, I would only remember the story beats that actually mattered and I would trim off all the excess. Which, I mean, this was supposed to be one book. And the fact that it's become a trilogy shows you that I have an issue with overwriting a little bit. <laughs> But <laughs> there's just so much I want to get into. But then as I progress and as the series progress and there's more plot threads that you have to tie up neatly instead of just starting them off and be like, look at this cool thing over here. Uh, I did have to go more into outlining. I did have to go more into planning. But when I plan, you know, I do like a couple story beats. Maybe I say what I want a chapter to be about, but that's always subject to change. I'm never bound to it. It's there in case I need it, but if I feel that it's more natural to grow away from it, I'm not going to like stop and rewrite the outline and go again. I'm going to just keep going. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, when I write again in the future, my process might completely change again because I think every story and every medium calls for something completely different in terms of how you develop it. Yes. Yes. You, yeah. you hit it. We've been talking about this a lot, honestly, is like- Have you? Yeah, like each book, because we we are working on our, our different projects and, and each time you have to kind of like teach yourself or relearn 
what your process is. And, and sometimes it's completely new. Yeah. Um, so you're really like speaking to our heart because it's just <laughs> true. Like, and, and you think, okay, I have to do it this way because that's how I did it before. But when you really like force yourself, it feels like that creativity gets blocked. Mm. Because maybe your body, Absolutely. your brain is just not in the same place you were before. So yeah. I think you go with it, however it works. Yeah. And I think that instinctive writing, that's just, that's another thing lately that I think we've been chatting about as well. Because to me, that's everything. Because I think you honor the characters. Like me and Montoya were just talking about this in DMs the other day. Like sometimes you just can't know the character first draft. Like sometimes you have to do a couple drafts to get to know them. And so it's natural that like, as you're getting to know them, you're like, well, no, he wouldn't do that. Exactly. You know? <laughs> I can't tell you how much mine have changed. My protagonists are so different than they used to be. And it's hard to let go of the original concept because you do get attached. But as you're saying, Melanie, like you reach a point where it's just wrong to try and shoehorn in your original idea when there's another version of the character that is more natural or better suits the story. So you got to let it go sometimes and change things up. Yes. I love it. I love to hear it. Now, what was your publishing process like with these books? I think um, I tend to be a bit of an outlier when it comes to this question because my books are self-published. Yeah. Um, we did not go through traditional publishing. We decided we wanted to do all of this ourselves. Um, I wanted you know, a little bit more control of my story. I wanted to make sure that I maintained full rights to my characters and my work in case I ever wanted to redirect and do something different with it. I wanted to have the wiggle room to do that. And I was also okay with us having fewer sales if, you know, from those sales, I was able to get a little bit more profit. So I don't think that self-publishing is better than traditional publishing. It's definitely not more convenient. Um, but I think that different authors should research all the different approaches and decide what they think suits them best. I was confident in my ability to market my own series, but some authors just want to write and then they hand it off and the marketing team does it for them. I love marketing. I wanted to experiment. So I decided to go the self-publishing route, but I could not have possibly achieved this project without Carson. So um, for a little bit of background, Carson is my fiance, but we are childhood friends. We grew up together and he has seen these books from draft one. He was the first fan, the first person to really believe in them. His specialty and his major is English and literature. And so he has been indispensable to me. Um, so much help with editing, formatting, just general feedback, chapter breakdowns, what might need to be rearranged, what he thinks he might need to encourage me to change or what to fight to keep. Uh, and then he was the one who did all the research on self-publishing companies. He was the one who formatted the books for publishing. He helped me arrange the covers. He helped me create the social media account. He runs that social media account. Mm -hmm. He set up all the recording for the audiobook so that I could read it for the audiobook. And then he then converted all of those files and uploaded them to Audible for me. So this is not a one set of hands type of project. If you do self-publishing, it's very important to have your circle and have your team. But shout out to Carson. Love him. Can't wait to marry him. He <laughs> is a champ. <laughs> you're gonna make me cry that was the cutest shit ever i'm living over here it's like the the author romance of so many people's dreams right that's yes. Yes. it is so cute and it deserves its own story i feel yes. like this is the next book for you to write is your guys's own love story but with when dragons had, maybe with dragons yeah, with dragons of course when um when we had four years i actually did write a short book about it and um, yeah. it's still sitting on his desk in his house. So I might need to make an extended cut soon. <laughs> yes. Oh, my gosh. Shout out to the supportive spouses, partners, moms, Absolutely. whoever it is, because you're so right, though. Like, it's it, it does require a team no matter which way you go about it. Like, if you want to do it properly, like, there's a lot. Like, I can resonate with reading my husband every version of every draft. Like, bless him. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he's not an English major. He's a truckie. So like, but he has a mind for it, you know? So yeah, I find yeah. when I bounce it off him, he picks out stuff I would never see. But like, yeah, it is these. So important. There's a lot of people behind the scenes who like make us feel like we can do this, you know? And so I just love that you've shared that and shouted him out because what a legend, you know? Yeah, right? No, <laughs> love him to death. Credit where credit is due, always. Couldn't have done it without him. That's beautiful. And I, it's honestly really nice to have you on and to have other like self-published indie authors yeah. on, um, because it, for the last little bit, we've had, you know, like 
traditionally published authors or agents, but it's really, really nice and refreshing to hear the other side of publishing because it, it really is something that can work so well for people who have it in them, I feel. But it's not an easy road, you know what oh, I mean? No, but I, none of them are. Exactly. Yeah. You gotta Absolutely love it. <laughs> yeah, totally. And and so I, it's so nice that there's different options because different people work in different ways. And obviously you are a marketing superstar and genius. <laughs> Thank um, you. No, seriously. Like it, it's really, really fun to watch you post your work on Instagram and just the troves of people, the throngs, the masses <laughs> that come out and like, and are commenting on what you're, you know, producing. It's really, really them. cool. Now, was that all just like organically done? How did you find these readers? Was it just mm. through Instagram? I would say 99.9% .9 of my marketing has been solely through Instagram. Mm. And I actually spent most of my life as a very anti-social media person. I never intended to join. I never intended to share my work online. I was just going to do my thing and see what happened with my life. Maybe even end up as like a high school teacher or something. And then the pandemic hit in 2020 and I needed something to fill my time. So I said, fine, I'll start posting my art on Instagram. So all of this has happened in the past three years and it has wow. been a complete whirlwind. Um, it was only in 2021 that I published the first one. And I had a bet going with Carson. I insisted that we would not sell over 40 copies. And he insisted that we would. And he won that bet, as you can guess. But um, so much of my marketing, I think, has been the fact that I haven't focused on the story. Mm. I have focused on the characters. Ooh. And so instead of trying to market my story and be like, hey guys, here's a young adult fantasy adventure and it's about this world with these monsters and these nice creatures and there's magic. Instead, I'm like, this is... Alia, and she's a leader who really struggles with leaning on others for help. And people hear that and they think, I can resonate with that. And that makes them want to know more about her. And when they ask for more about her, I say, well, I'm so glad you asked. She's from this book series that I'm writing and there's more information in my bio. And then I pin that comment. And so everybody else who has questions immediately goes to the comments to see what's going on. They see the pinned comment is about the book series. And then if they want to, if they're invested enough to keep looking, I have all of that information ready in a highlight on my Instagram and people can scroll through, see all the links, see the official account. And it just creates this really easy accessible flow of like, oh, if you just click here, all the information you need is right there and you have access to this extended story. So I think by focusing on the characters instead of like the overall lore, which for a lot of people can be very intimidating, yes. especially if they're not usually readers. A lot of people reach out to me and they say, I'm not a reader. I don't like books. I don't like long form content, but this series was so like accessible and fun. And it was like, it felt like a safe introduction and now I'm interested in now I'm going to go buy more books. And that is so exciting. But um, I think it's because I'm not even approaching it as a writer. I'm approaching it as an artist. Mm. And so I'm saying, here's some visuals. Here's this character's core struggle. And then everything just goes from there. It's crazy. It was, you know, the luck of the algorithm for sure, but also just character-based marketing, I think was the key. Mm. It doesn't Genius. sound like luck to me. It sounds like a lot of damn hard work. It is a lot of work and a lot of luck. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to try that. Honest, I want to try yes, that. I'm going to use do. the artwork that you created for Sinner's Isle. And I'm going to try that because I've never thought of this. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I was never. taking I, mean, I have so much more. If we have another Zoom meeting sometime, I can really get into it with you guys. There's so yeah. much I could tell you. I, okay, it goes tomorrow. So well. We're ready tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> no, I would I, love that. Yeah, we, we got to move on. But I'm saying okay. like another time, another time. Yes. It's happening. It, when it's you're happening. free next, we shall get you on because I need to learn. I need I need a, a course. Help me, please. <laughs> <laughs> I shall teach you. Do not worry, my child. No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're not working. I, I need to do like a master class or something, I'm sure. But yeah, I would love that. I believe you could teach Yes. <laughs> For sure. Get my little suit and tie. Hello, students. Welcome to the chorus. <laughs> I will pay. I will pay good money for this. I promise. No, not you guys. You guys get like a bestie discount because we're all best okay, friends good. now. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Was there anything yeah. like unexpected as you went through this process that came up for you? Honestly, just 
the fact that it took off, mm. I would say was the most unexpected thing. I knew self-publishing, I was not going to get the same like marketing power that somebody going through a well-known publishing company would get. And mm. that was kind of something that comforted me because I think a lot of creatives deal with this to write the kind of stories that we write, we have to be sensitive people. And so it's really scary to put your work out there especially when you have such personal connections to the characters within them. And so to have it gain so much attention and have people really breaking down this world and these characters, sometimes liking it, sometimes thinking it's like the corniest, worst thing they've ever read, just feeling that kind of like, oh my gosh, I'm so exposed. Everybody is seeing these parts of my soul without even knowing like that they come from me. They're just thinking it's a story and then them being able to pick it apart was terrifying. And um, I think it took me a long time to even process that people were looking to me as an author. I wouldn't even call myself an author for like the first year that the books were out. I said, no, 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 writer, writer. I'm not an author. You have published books. You are an author. You don't even have to have published books to be an author. But I felt like I was safer if I was like, oh, that's not me. That's not me. So just coming to terms with the fact that I did make this and I should be proud of it, I think was the hardest part for me. I think a lot of us were so afraid to be proud of our own work for fear of coming off as arrogant. But if you pour this much of your time and your life and your personality and your soul into something you create, I think that you have the right to be proud of it. And that's what I wish that I had known when I was younger and when I first started out. I'm just soaking it in. That was like, that was like a ride of church moment. <laughs> and I, I loved it. I love your, your passion just shines through, honestly. Like it's just such a lie and, and it's, and I just think you need it to be in this industry because it is tough. It's a lot of you like do. banging your head against the wall. It's a lot of waiting and, and yeah, it's, but it's a lot of joy and it's a lot of passion and that just, it's what I love. It just gives me all yes. the happy tingles. <laughs> yeah. Well, what has been like a great moment for you, the most rewarding for you in this journey? The most rewarding, honestly, I feel like I already talked about it a little bit, but just hearing that people are using this story to connect to others or yes. using this story as the inspiration to continue reading or yeah. even to try out writing. I get a lot of messages from people and I wish I had time to reply to them all saying, you know, like, oh, I really liked your work and it's cool that you're close to my age and it's interesting to see that I might be able to do this. Mm -hmm. Or even people who are much younger than me or much older than me saying, no, I want to try now. Now that I know that you did it, I want to try. I think that even if those people aren't successful and I only can hope that they will be, I want success for everyone who is willing to put themselves out there because it's such a brave thing. To know that I made them somehow brave enough to attempt to put their work out there, to put themselves out there and to really pursue something that a lot of people are discouraged from pursuing because of the lack of stability. That feeling is very fulfilling and it makes me want to keep creating stories. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Was, Monty, you're <laughs> misting up over there. It was beautiful. Yeah, it was good. It was good. <laughs> I'm the clamps. I'm the clamps. It's good. <laughs> it was so beautiful. I see our time is ticking away, so I'm gonna actually jump ahead a little to. We've covered a few. We've in covered just conversation. a few. We can jump. I, I feel like you're a wise soul, and I want to know. Thank looking you. Back at all you've accomplished, what advice would you give a younger version of yourself before you kind of set out? I know you started from the start, really young, but maybe when you started to take it seriously, like I'm gonna go for this. What advice? Would I would you say. Have? If I had the chance to walk through a portal and talk to her, mm. not little me, but the me that was first really trying to do this, because I couldn't say yeah. anything to little me that she wouldn't already know. I'd be like, hey, you're yeah. going to be a really successful artist and author. She'd be like, duh. <laughs> yes, of course. Because the confidence of children is beautiful. But um, <laughs> if I could go back to like 18, 19 year old me, like, hey, we're really going to do this. These are the things you need to be ready for. Mm. I think I would tell her just to like not tie her professional worth so closely to her worth as a whole person. I think that very often I shed needless tears over the fact that if people didn't like my work, it meant that they didn't like me. It meant that I didn't have anything good to say. I didn't have anything to add to their lives, which first of all, 
it's my life. Do I, do I add to my life? Good. Then great. I'm done. I don't need to worry about other people. But you know, when you, when you want to tell the story, you want other people to like it. Mm -hmm. And I was so afraid that if it didn't do as well as I expected, or if it did better than I expected, it meant something was going horribly wrong. I didn't have any idea of what I was doing. I had no idea what was going to happen. That terrified me to the point of making me physically sick sometimes. And I think what I would have said to her and what I would say to any young author who's in that position is you as a person and as a soul is completely different from who you are as a creator. Mm. What you create is very personal to you and that's great and it should be. But it doesn't mean that it allows other people to make a judgment on who you are as a whole. Who you are as a whole is so valuable and what you want to make is valuable for that reason. But remember that it's not all that you are. Mm. Damn, girl, you came with the fire today. My God. <laughs> she just took the mic and just dropped it right there. And she just dropped it. I also it. love public speaking. That's one of my side things. So. I can tell. I can tell. You have a gift. You have a gift for it. Thank you. And Thank you. you. Very, yeah, you very much. I think our listeners are going to soak this one up. Excellent. Yeah. Good to no, hear. this is one of those episodes I think that you, you need to re-listen to. No. I know I find myself like sometimes... Because when we interview, sometimes you don't take it all in because you're like making sure we have the que the next question okay. right. Um, this will be one of those that I'm going to definitely re-listen because you had so many amazing things to say, Riley, and you're just such a wise soul. And I cannot yeah. wait to see you do more and more and more. And I can't wait to read everything that you produce and um, just take it all in. So honestly... I am so proud to know you and to watch you Aww. grow. And honestly, thank you for joining us today. Seriously. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, I am just now starting to actually talk about the process of making the work. And I'm really glad that I get to make this information accessible to other young authors. Mm -hmm. I do not believe in gatekeeping. Like, let's all share everything we know. So it was just really great to sit with you guys and talk about what that was like for me. And I am really honored to be here. I freaking miss you. <laughs> I I seriously I agree with Angela. You are welcome back whenever you have the free time because I think oh, thank a, you. that's a real mindset Angela and I share. We try to be as open at, with the information that people have hidden for so long. And so that energy is so welcome here. We would absolutely love you to come back and share all yes, your of course. So yeah, it's gonna cut us off soon. So if that happens, we I just say goodbye and thank you so much for having me. And if I disappear, then I'm sure y'all can record your closing statements in another meeting. But thank yeah. you again so much for having me. I'd love to come back. And, Perfect. you know, good luck to everybody out there who's just now getting out there, starting to write. I'm proud of you. Yes. Well Riley's said. Riley's the best. Well said. <laughs> She's done. She finished the show. She's perfect. <laughs>